All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yannick Buechi. I'm originally from Switzerland. Um, I live in New York, but I go to Colby College. And this summer, I worked in uh, the Emerson Lab. So my mentors were uh, David Emerson, Jake Beam, and Jared Scott. And so I studied the micro microbiology of a polychaete worm, uh, Neris hedistae diversicolor. And so my project is pretty simple. I'm just looking at what's inside these worms. Um, but I think my, the hardest work here is convincing you as to why this is important. Um, and so a little introduction uh, to these worms. They grow up to 20 centimeters. They live in mudflats, estuaries, uh, shallow brackish waters. Um, and they're very important ecologically because they are food for fish, food for crustaceans, shorebirds. And they also have various feeding behaviors. So they're carnivores, detritivores, and filter feeders. Um, they're also key bioturbators, so they build these U-shaped and Y-shaped burrows, um, which basically overturns the sediment and influences the microbiology and the chemistry of these sediments. Um, and because of that, they're actually being used as trace metal monitors, um, looking at uh, studies looking at water quality, and um, they're used a lot by toxicologists because um, their guts actually are able to process things very quickly. And so if you take a worm and you open it up, um, what you see inside is a pr pretty good indication of um, the sediment quality at that present moment. They're also very uh, important because they are used as bait by fishermen, if you guys want to fish for a striper. Um, and so these worms are also very important because of uh, important environmental interactions. They're involved in a lot of interactions. And uh, I talked about these burrows, and one thing about these burrows is that um, once they uh, create these burrows, a lot of oxygen and a lot of other chemicals come in, and um, there's a, the chemistry of these burrows is, is quite diverse. So you've got denitrification, nitrification, iron oxidation, amongst a lot of other things. And uh, Megan is actually gonna study these burrows um, and their, their oxidation rates. Um, but something else is these worms have a very interesting behavior uh, when they filter feed. And so what they do is that they cast these mucus nets all the way down these burrows right here, and then they undulate, and that brings phytoplankton from the water column down into these burrows, and the phytoplankton sticks to the mucus nets, and then the worms ingest that mucus and, and, and the phytoplankton. And um, so why this is relevant is because what's inside these worms might be influencing all of these different processes. Um, and so it's important to see the microbiome in or order to understand uh, what's going on in all of this. And so the methods, um, we went to the mud flats. It was great. Um, three, different, <laughs> three different sampling sites, the Darling Marine Center, uh, the Eddy, and the Cross River Preserve. Um, these pictures are actually all from one sample site, the Eddy. And um, collected some worms from these, uh, from these mud flats, brought them back to the lab. Um, some of them I immediately killed and sterilized in 70% ethanol. Uh, others I put into these petri dishes right here and um, starved them for 64 hours, um, and, or until I couldn't see any more sediments in their guts. And, uh, I also, from these starved worms, I also collected fecal pellets. You can see there on the top, top left is a fecal pellet. Um, and so all of these uh, samples were frozen, and then uh, they were then used um, for DNA extraction. So we used the power soil DNA extract isolation kit. And the first time we did this, uh, we actually got very low sequence yields. So we did it a second time using a PCI protocol, so phenylchloroform isoamyl. Um, and that worked a lot better, so we had a lot higher sequence yields. And we sent those samples out, um, and we, uh, so I got back a, uh, basically computer files, and I used a program called Mother uh, to do an OTU-based analysis using a 16S database. So 16S is a, um, a sequence that is found in a lot of bacteria and archaea, um, and so it makes sure that what I'm looking at is ba either bacteria or archaea, not some worm DNA. Uh, and so my results, uh, I'm gonna quickly run through those because I do have a summary um, graph. And so this, this, these were the results for the whole worms. And so we found some firmicutes, um, which are present also in, in human guts, um, a lot of proteobacteria and SAR-406. I would pay attention to proteobacteria and SAR-406. There are very recurring patterns in all of these results. Um, star worms, again, we see 
Um, a bit of cyanobacteria, not, not, meant, not much, or not a significant amount. Um, proteobacteria and SARFOR6, again, are very present, uh, and WPS2. And so, oh, also, I forgot to mention, these are all uh, relative abundance of the top four phyla. So there's a lot more in there, but these are just the top four phyla that were present. Uh, looking at the fecal pellets, uh, a surprising amount of cyanobacteria. Um, in the discussion, I'll talk about how we have to be careful about how we interpret this. Um, but again, proteobacteria and SARFOR6 are present, and WPS2. And so this is a, a summary graph, um, and Jake actually uh, got some sediment and worm burrow samples and had already analyzed them and let me use them so that I could compare those with the fecal pellet, the whole starved worms, and the whole worms that I got. And um, the thing that jumps out is really, you can see that the sediment and worm burrow communities right here uh, that you can see have a lot of bacteriodetes, planktomycetes, chloroflexi, and acidobacteria is very different from what you see in the fecal pellets, uh, the whole starved worm, and the whole worm. And, um, but there are also some, some, a lot of things in common. For example, proteobacteria is found all throughout all of these uh, samples. Um, however, SARFOR6 is a very interesting result. We only see it in the fecal pellets, whole starved worms, and whole worms, really. So, and then we had to zoom into proteobacteria just because there's such a large and diverse group. Um, the zeta proteobacteria that David Emerson is interested in looking at. Uh, unfortunately, he was disappointed. There was not much in there. Um, and we found a lot of alpha proteobacteria and uh, some delta proteobacteria. And yeah, so what, what does this all mean? So um, again, we found that there was a clear difference between the sediment and uh, burrow microbiome and worm uh, microbiome uh, communities. So that's, uh, it's very important as to know that um, these are very different um, ecological, uh, there's very different ecological me mechanisms going on in, in these two, um, both outside of the worm and inside of the worm. And um, the proteobacteria are the most abundant across all samples. Um, we found that alpha proteobacteria dominate um, that proteobacteria class in the fecal pellet, the whole worm, and the whole um, starved worm samples. And then I want to talk about the SARFRO6 um, because that's very interesting. Uh, these only grew in the fecal pellet uh, and the worms, and uh, these SAR-406 are actually related to Fibrobacter, which is a gut uh, microorganism or microbiome organism, and can actually be a candidate as a symbiont because uh, even though we haven't studied a lot about, or there's not been a lot of studies about SAR-406, uh, apparently it's involved or implicated in the sulfur cycle. And what that means is that they might actually be helping these worms detoxify sulfide um, because these worms are actually surprisingly resistant to high concentrations of sulfide in the sediment. Um, and then the cyanob cyanob eh, cyanobacteria. Um, so we found a lot of cyanobacteria in fecal pellets. And one way to interpret that is that these worms might be grazing on the cyanobacteria um, at the surface of the sediment. And then, because their guts process things so quickly, um, you wouldn't see those in the, in the guts, but you would see those in the fecal pellets, and they might just be growing it on the fecal pellets. But um, another, uh, another interpretation would be, mother is not perfect, or the program is not perfect, not mother. Um, <laughs> so so um, uh, what th that might be is actually, um, it's actually chloroplasts from diatoms that are actively being ingested by these worms. And um, I think chloroplasts and these cyanobacteria have the same signature. Um, and so it might, these, uh, th those high amounts of cyanobacteria might actually be um, uh, chloroplast. So um, future directions. Uh, there's a lot still to be known about these worms. Uh, we need to further analyze those microbiomes so when uh, when I did all of this experiment, I got a huge taxonomy file. There's so much more to be analyzed in that data. It, it would take a long time to really um, know exactly what's inside, what types of cyanobacteria, are they anaerobic, aerobic? Um, and then isolate the guts. So originally, I was going to dissect these worms and look just at their guts, but I had a very, very, very hard time doing that, and so I gave up um, and just decided to use the whole worm instead. Uh, then sampling on an environmental gradient. There's so many um, factors that, that might affect the behavior of these worms. Um, for example, uh, because they're, they're detritivores, uh, carnivores, and filter feeders, 
Um, maybe a phytoplankton or a more phytoplankton limited environment might cause these worms to become more carnivorous, and so that might affect in turn what's inside, what's inside of them. Um, and then I'll also look at the understanding and the metabolic capabilities of SARS-4-06 um, in order to make sure that they are in fact implicated in the sulfur cycle and that they are, or that they could be a legitimate candidate as, a, um, as an endosymbiont to these worms. Um, I think I didn't mention that, but uh, there's been studies on oligochaete worms that have found actually um, endosymbionts that have helped them also detoxify all sorts of chemicals. And so this might be the same for these polychaete worms. Um, and yeah, check for other endosymbiotic relationships between these worms and bacteria. And so this summer, uh, these, there's these two pictures right here are pictures of the I took. Um, and uh, when I came in, I you know, thought like, oh, worms, you know, like really ugly and like alien-like and you know, kind of like giant or like really small versions of these giant monsters, but they're actually really beautiful creatures. Also, they're really important ecologically. If you look at this picture, I did not take this. But um, it's, I don't know, they kind of look dragon-like. So with that being said, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, my mentors, Jake Bean, Jared Scott, David Emerson, who is not here today. He's at a conference. Um, but thank you so much for a great summer. Um, I'd like to thank everyone else who's helped me uh, in my project. I'd like to thank Bigelow, the NSF, and Colby College for funding. And yeah, any questions? I actually didn't look into that, um, the alpha proteobacteria. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to. I would, I, in theory, yeah, look at like what exactly, what exact types of alpha proteos because they are also a very diverse group. But yeah, this it just shows that there's a lot of work still to be done here. Um, this was just like a very general kind of picture of what's inside, and still there's still we still have to check to see if you know um, there are contaminants and other sorts of stuff in there. So it, it just takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We tried to try to make it, but I have another question. So, do you think this size of bacteria, true size of bacteria, there are chloroplasts? Mm -hmm. If there are chloroplasts, they're not reproducing with the metabolites. Why do you think it may not be digested? Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, also a very interesting question. Um, yeah, because I was trying to. Uh, see if they were either gram positive or gram negative, but I think I was talking with someone else, and apparently they don't fit into either of these two categories. So um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting question to see. Um, we are also talking about how uh, it's, we still don't know, um, because these worms are surface sterilized, um, but that still doesn't mean that what we found could have been outside the worm. Like we assume that most of what we found is inside, but it still might be stuff like outside of the worm. So. There's a lot of assumptions being made, but yeah, it's, yeah. Yes. Um, you showed uh, percent differences in the, uh, so almost a diversity of mm -hmm. the bacteria that were in there. I was wondering if you measured total bacteria and if that differed between a fed worm and a starved worm. Um, I definitely measured a total, uh, actually, no, I think I just had the number of sequences. Um, yeah, I, d I did not pay attention to that, yeah. unfortunately. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, good question. <laughs> There we go. So I hope you're not all as starving as the onyx worms yet. Um, I aim to distract you from your heter heterotrophic appetites for a while with a discussion of 
some very interesting chemolithotrophic metabolisms. Um, and to start off, I'm Megan Harder. I go to Carleton College in Minnesota, and I have been working with Jake Beam in Dave Emerson's lab to understand the rates of microbially mediated iron oxidation in the same marine worm burrows that Yannick was working with. So to start off, these are iron oxidizing bacteria. They live in a variety of environments, both freshwater, fresh, and marine. These are hydrothermal vents. These are seeps that you might just see on a ditch on the side of a, on the side of a road. And they have a very unique metabolism because these bacteria survive off of the oxidation of iron. And you can easily identify them by these mats of iron, orange rusty iron oxides that they create as waste products. And this metabolism follows the following chemical formula. Um, and in order to exploit this energy source, these bacteria need to compete with abiotic iron oxidation that would just occur normally in the natural environment um, at high oxygen conditions. So at low oxygen conditions, these bacteria are actually able to outpace the rates of abiotic iron oxidation. However, they create a secondary problem for themselves by um, forming these iron oxyhydroxide waste products, which actually serve to catalyze iron oxidation and speed up what would normally take place very slowly and just in the water column. And so part of what I'm interested in doing is comparing the rates of iron oxidation that are completely attributable to these iron oxidizing bacteria versus the rates that may be caused by this catalyzation of iron oxides um, from their waste products. Um, the broader view of what I've been doing these past 10 weeks is looking at the iron oxidation specifically within the burrows of marine worms. As Yannick already touched on, um, bioturbation facilitates the cycling of redox sensitive elements all through the sediment at depth. And this is because they pump through um, water that would and extend the um, water sediment interface deep into the sediment and oxygenate the sediment at depth, which wouldn't occur without the burrows. Um, so you can actually see if you take a sediment core and slice it, all of these small orange spots are worm burrows and they're orange because they're coated in iron oxides. Um, what we did to look we, um, sorry, we were interested in looking specifically at the rates of iron oxidation within these burrows. And to do that, we literally did groundbreaking research and went to a local med mud flat in Edgecombe called the Eddy and took these roughly 10 centimeter deep sediment cores of the mud and sliced them to expose the worm burrows as you saw on the previous slide. We extracted these worm burrows and immersed them in a solution of artificial seawater and ferrous chloride for iron oxidizers to eat. And in these little reaction vessels, we measured the depletion of oxygen and iron over time for about 30 minutes. We did this for live burrows and we repeated the experiment for burrows that had been killed with sodium azide. Um, and from this, we derived rate constants, which are just a metric for comparing rates of chemical reactions across varying concentrations. And so that is what is represented here on the y-axis of this box plot. Um, here on the x-axis, you can see the different treatments. So the live oxygen depletion rates, 
the live iron depletion rates, and then the killed rates for each. Um, as you can see from this box plot, there is a lot of variability in our data. And although these are not statistically significant data, you can at least see a downward trend of killed rates generally being lower than live rates and li uh, iron depletion rates being lower than oxygen rates. So why is this the case? Um, we were looking at very heterogeneous communities of microorganisms. In fact, iron oxidizing bacteria only make up about 5% of the worm burrow community. And all the rest are heterotrophs and bacteria that survive on other element cycles. And so this created a huge spread in our data and oxygen rates that are much exceeding what you would expect from the chemical formula just um, for iron oxidation. Um, and then we also saw huge spreads just within the data points for each experiment. Um, for instance, you'll see for the iron, uh, uh, iron rates, depletion rates, there are actually negative values represented here. And those represented something that we didn't expect. These are showing iron production over that 30 minute time period. Um, and iron production that was similar in magnitude to iron depletion um, for other experiments that we ran. Furthermore, uh, we also did the same experiment looking at pure chemical rates, just the same setup without the worm burrows added. And you can see here, again, these, um, these error bars show one standard deviation, so not significant, but there is a, a downward trend of higher uh, live and killed rates of iron oxidation than um, chemical rates. And we think this is attributable to the idea that I already touched on of autocatalysis by the iron oxide waste products. Um, compared to a previous study, our values are about an order of magnitude lower. However, this study by Rents et al. Show, um, measured the rates of iron oxidation by freshwater bacteria um, that live in those big orange bacterial mats. And Therefore, their um, mats of iron oxidizing bacteria were nearly pure cultures for all intents and purposes compared to our 5% iron oxidizer communities. Their um, constraining rates from iron oxidation that was occurring completely from these iron oxidizers. Um, Likewise, their methods were a bit more precise. They were using cyclic voltammetry, which can have a very, a much higher sensitivity to these changes. Um, and I'd like to reiterate that um, all of these element cycles can interfere in some way with iron oxidation. So with our very heterogeneous microbial community, there is also the counterpart of the um, element community of uh, redox sensitive compounds. So specifically manganese and sulfur can themselves oxidize iron and possibly conflate our results. Um, we can, however, say that iron oxidizers are likely responsible for at least part of the iron oxidation rates that we saw because they were significantly, well, not significantly, but they were higher than the chemical rates or the killed rates. Um, and finally, just because it is a natural system that we're measuring an in situ um, phenomenon, there is a lot of variability that would be expected. I'd like to finish by acknowledging the NSF Bigelow Laboratory and Dave Fields and Nicole Poulton for providing feedback on this talk over the last several weeks. 
and then my entire lab group for providing support. And yeah. Any questions? Any questions?